Hey, am I on? Great. Good morning, everyone. Happy long weekend to you all. The long weekend that most people didn't realise was a long weekend, but it's a long weekend, so we'll celebrate that. Uh, lovely to be here with you all this morning, and uh, we're going to be continuing on with our look at Ezekiel, and we're looking at Ezekiel 34. And as I've been preparing this sermon, I've, I've been pondering the whole idea of leadership and, and what it looks like in a faith context, what it looks like for a child of God. And so I started with a, with a really broad question. What is a leader? What kind of person is a leader? Is it simply one who leads? One who commands? One who demands respect? But that's, that's really broad. So I thought maybe a better question is, what makes an effective leader? Are they inspiring? Is it their example? Perhaps they set clear goals and communicate these really well and have a vision for the future. But those goals and visions might not be godly. So then I thought, okay, well, what, what makes a servant leader? Is it their concern for the well-being and growth of others? Maybe it's their honesty about themselves. Maybe it's the way they create communities where everyone is welcome, where healing and grace are offered. Is it someone who looks to serve their followers? Because, you know, leaders and their agendas aren't always popular, and neither are prophets. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been starting to dig into the book and life of Ezekiel, who was one of God's great prophets to his people. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest who was taken, along with much of his nation, into exile in Babylon, where some commentators think he lived for over 25 years. And unlike his contemporary Daniel, who largely served God in the city palace, they think that Ezekiel worked in the rural and regional parts of the Babylonian Empire. But I'm going to say... I don't think Ezekiel would have been very popular amongst the people who heard him. Because his God-given mission was to explain to these exiles, these people who'd been taken away from their land and plonked down in a foreign country, his God-given mission was to explain to these exiles why God had brought about and permitted Judah's captivity. And I can imagine that this question would have been really front of mind for these exiles. You know, that they were saying things like, I thought we were God's chosen people. How could he let us be taken away from our land? Now our temple's been destroyed. Our country doesn't even exist anymore. Why has this happened? Does God even care? Is God even real? And the message that Ezekiel repeats over and over again to these people is this. That's it. So that they will know I am the Lord. Now, Ezekiel's name means may God strengthen, apparently, and I reckon he needed every bit of strength from God that he could get for the task that was set before him, because he had to get these people to understand that God would no longer overlook their sin. That's a tough message. And it was their sin. It wasn't just their ancestors' sin or their grandparents' sin or their brothers' and sisters' sin. It was their sin, and they had to own it. And they also had to understand that there are consequences for sin. And they were living those right now in Babylon. So for this understanding to really 
sink in. All of the people's emotional supports, all of their symbols of their own security, like the temple in Jerusalem and like their heritage in the land, had to be removed. Ezekiel's job was to try to bring these people to the point where they could no longer stay in denial about why they woke up and found themselves in Babylon. Bring them to a point where they could no longer trust in anything but God and God alone. To a point where they will know that I am the Lord. And a lot of that's the first half of Ezekiel. And once this hard truth has been confronted, Ezekiel moves on to sharing God's promises of a new future for the people. And this future is going to involve their restoration back to their land and restoration back to a state of blessing. God promises to transform the people. And this transformation is going to start from the top down. The leadership of Judah is item one on God's transformation agenda. And that's going to be our focus today. So if you've got your Bible, grab it out to Ezekiel 34, and we're going to read verses 1 to 7 and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened. The sick you have not healed. The injured, you have not bound up. The strayed, you have not brought back. The lost, you have not sought. And with force and harshness, you have ruled them. Can I get the next slide, Ralph? Oh, there we are. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds. And I will require my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. Not popular, probably. You know, God makes it very clear to his people here through Ezekiel that it is the kings and priests of Judah, these bad shepherds, who are chiefly responsible for their current situation, for their exile. Ezekiel says they have fed themselves instead of feeding the sheep. It is they who have exploited their people and their position for their own financial gain. These leaders have done all that they could to make their own lives rich and great and fat and easy. They've made sure of the profits of their positions and have got into their own hands as much of the wealth and property of their own people as they could. These shepherds have failed to fulfil their duty to God's flock. And the second complaint against these shepherds is that they've failed to take care of the weak and the ill in their community. And they've not sought out those people who were lost and who were isolated and who were lonely. The kings didn't care if people lived or died. They didn't right wrongs, they didn't ease suffering, they didn't protect the innocent, they didn't provide for the poor. And the priests, well, they haven't taught the people God's word. They haven't warned those who were going astray. In fact, it's they who have led them astray from the right worship of their God. And the result of this is that God's people were scattered by enemies and by poverty 
and by war, and their leaders did not care. Well, God has now called these leaders to account for their leadership or lack thereof. He sets himself against these shepherds and he says that he will take his people from their hands. God says he will remove these leaders from their positions of power and rescue his people from these leaders. But I wonder, what would God say to today's leaders? Are they any better than the shepherds in this passage of Ezekiel? Do we know of leaders who exploit their position of influence for their own gain? Do we know of leaders who neglect their responsibilities to care for those who need care? Now, it's very easy to point the finger at politicians and at others in very visible positions of power. But I think to read Ezekiel honestly means looking at our own leadership too. Are you a leader of people? Are you in a position, whether that's paid or voluntary, where you have influence over others? How are you leading? Then from the leaders, God shifts his focus to the people themselves. Item two on his transformation agenda, just in case they thought they had no guilt in their nation's current situation. Let's have a look at uh, verses 17 to 19 and verse 21. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats, is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? You push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. Through Ezekiel, God bluntly tells his people that they are not innocent of sin and that they've helped to bring about their own exile. So yet, while the kings and priests bear the major responsibility for their nation's plight, the sin of God's people had stretched through every part of society. They've sinned against God through idolatry, but they've also sinned against their fellow men and women because they have oppressed the weak and the frail. So even though these rich, well-off citizens didn't have the power to rule, like the kings and the priests did, they've made good use of the opportunity which their wealth gave them to bear down hard on their poorer neighbours. They have ruined and destroyed the resources that God provided for everyone. And in so doing, have deprived some of their community of their basic needs. And they didn't care about the circumstances of their fellow humans. What could God be saying to us here? Well, it's true that we in the flock are personally responsible for our own actions and for how we live. And we too will answer to God, just as our leaders will. And so, I wonder, does our consumption of the world's resources deprive others of their basic needs? Do we bully or marginalise or just simply ignore groups in our own society through our position of power? Have we pushed people out of community and nation because of our own desires to be right and powerful? Do we care about the dire circumstances of much of humanity today, some of which have been caused by our own greed? So what is God going to do about the plight 
of his people in exile? Well, he promises to transform the way leadership is performed in Judah by becoming the people's own shepherd. He promises this. I'm going to read verses 11 to 16. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Well, this is God's new covenant with his people. After his judgment comes renewal and he renews his covenant of peace with his people. How many times do you see I will in this passage? God is determined in his promises. He will intervene in the lives of his people and return these captives safely to their land. And we know this happened when many thousands of Jews returned triumphantly from Babylon back to their own nation under the leadership of Ezra and others. And this leadership was godly and it helped to re-establish the people in the right worship of God and in right relationship with each other. But this is not the end of God's promises in this chapter of Ezekiel because there are promises for us too. God knew his people's hearts. He still does. That sin is ever present. And he knew that no matter how godly his people's leaders were, they could never be perfect. So God makes this promise of transformation as well. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. I will make with them a covenant of peace. And I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. They shall be showers of blessing. And they shall know that I am the Lord. When I break the bars of their yoke and deliver them from the hand of those who enslaved them, they shall dwell securely and none shall make them afraid. And I will provide for them. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. And you are my sheep, human sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. Now this is real transformation. God promises the people a better shepherd, one of the line of David, a shepherd who will provide for their needs, a shepherd who will care for his flock always. This shepherd, Jesus said these words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. 
just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd. He is the shepherd promised by God. Because Jesus is the only one who can bring all peoples and all nations and all cultures into God's family, God's flock. In him, all of God's promises are true. This is what God's kingdom looks like. This is what happens when God intervenes in the lives of his people through Jesus, the good shepherd. Because God's covenantal care can always reach you. Even when you are in a mess, perhaps of your own making. Are you lost and alone? Jesus is looking for you. He has said that you are of such worth and value to him that he will go to the ends of the earth to find you. Are you broken? Jesus came to bind up the broken and to heal the sick. And he still does that today. Are you tired? Hungry for meaning? Thirsty for living water? Jesus can meet all your needs and he offers you rest. In him, God showers us with every spiritual blessing from heaven. Are you scared? Scared sheep can find safety and can cast all their cares onto Jesus. Because in Jesus, God promises that none can make us afraid. If God is for us, then who can be against us? Are you struggling with sin? Jesus has paid the price in full for your sins. He has laid down his life for your own. He has broken the power of evil and triumphed over it and your sins are forgiven. When Jesus is the shepherd of our lives, we are transformed. We are new creations filled with God's spirit and this transformation can then flow out into our relationships and our communities. Our relationship with Jesus should transform our leadership of others as we follow his servant leadership model. And it should transform our relationships with each other in this world as we care for the sick and comfort the lonely and share what we have and seek out those who are lost and alone. Have you been transformed by Jesus? Has his sacrificial love changed you? Are you allowing him to transform the way that you lead others? Are you allowing him to transform your relationship with other people? I wonder what God's spirit is prompting you to today. Let's pray.